Welcome everyone watching from home or in their studios. Um, my name is Kelsey Dillo. I'm the gallery manager here at Aramont School of Arts and Crafts. Welcome to our fourth discussion for our instructor roundtable series. So our goal here is to highlight the talented artists that were scheduled to teach at Aramont this year. We want to discuss ideas in contemporary craft and we want to strengthen the connections within our community. Check out the 2020 instructor exhibition on our website for more information on all of our instructors and their work. Um, so for everyone watching at home, I want to remind y'all that while you'll be muted during our discussion, we encourage you to post questions throughout the discussion in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. We're going to do our best to get to as many of those um, towards the end of our conversation today. More information about our panelists will be shared in the chat bar on the side of your screen. Um, and today's discussion will be recorded and posted online um, later in the week. So today we're talking with four really exciting artists whose work relates to our theme of art outside. So our panel today includes Ann Beyer, ceramic artist and educator in Paducah, Kentucky. Mark Hendry, artist, educator and director of Mountain Heritage uh, Handcraft in Blue Ridge, Georgia. Anna Johnson, studio artist and educator in Asheville, North Carolina, mm -hmm. and Kenya Miles, textile artist, farmer, and founder of Blue Light Junction in Baltimore, Maryland. So thanks again, all four of y'all, for being here with us. I'm really excited about this discussion today. Um, so our panelists are going to introduce themselves, and then we're going to get onto the topic of art outside. So Anne, do you want to start us out with an introduction, the workshop that you were scheduled to teach here at Aramont, and your work as it relates to our theme today? Sure. So um, my name is Anne Beyer, and I'm a ceramic artist, and I specialize in wood firing. So the workshop that I was scheduled to teach this fall was focused on the train wood kiln that is at Aeromont. So it was called Train and Retain. So focusing on kind of um, ways to get the most out of kind of solving problems while firing. So really kind of retaining the information that you learn throughout that because it's kind of bombarding how much goes on with one firing. So luckily um, I'll be back Fingers crossed, one year from now, teaching the same course. So um, if you're interested in wood firing, I'd love to have you in class. Um, so wood firing has a lot to do with being outside. So I was super excited about this theme all week. Um, the picture on the right there is from Elbian Anagama, which is the city where I went to undergrad. Elbian College is there as well. And I worked with wood fire artist Ken Shenstone for on and off for about seven years and really just got in tune with um, weather is a huge factor that goes into firing outside. So all different types of seasons. Michigan can be very cold. So this uh, image here kind of gives you an idea of what it's like to be firing for 24 hours outside in conditions like that. I got my graduate degree from Indiana University. So that's what that second picture was there. And these are some pieces I made there as well. Um, and I mostly fired a train kiln there. Um, wood firing to me, I kind of want to say at the core of it is really about movement. So it's about using your body, about engaging with um, the physicality of our environment. And for me, kind of growing up, I've always been a person that's had a hard time sitting still. You know, I always want to move around and I want to engage with um, my my outdoor environment and my body and there's a lot of kind of um beautiful kind of poetic um similarities between the human body and the way that a kiln behaves um so i think that's kind of a big attraction to me with that um type of firing process so the pieces here, this is one of my bullet pieces, um, and it has natural ash over the top of it. And my relationship to working um, with these kilns, you know, it has a lot of, there's a way that the kilns are put together, there's shapes that are inside of them that kind of lend themselves to certain formal conversations with the pieces that are put into them. 
when you load these kinds of kilns, um, it's kind of like one giant game of Tetris. So there's all these different pieces and they fit together. And um, there's a lot of just kind of spatial play um, at these different zones of the kiln. Um, so this is a piece that to me, it was a, kind of a beautiful basic form that I could use as kind of a three dimensional canvas. So there's this kind of balance that you're always looking for when you're wood firing of, you know, making sure that you place pieces thoughtfully, you're thinking about the different zones of the kiln and also, um, you know, letting those, that natural vocabulary of the chemical um, reactions, the reactions of the fire. So kind of letting that process, you know, showcasing the natural process as well. So it's kind of this balance between um, having that control of where you're placing work and understanding the material, the natural materials that are gonna come together to create certain surfaces and also letting go of that control to allow for some serendipitous effects. Um, so this kind of last piece that I want to end with too is that, um, you know, firing ceramic pieces in a wood kiln has so much to do with just kind of understanding a lot of these natural laws that we exist with every day, right? So we have to contend with gravity. There's certain chemical reactions that happen at certain temperatures. Different types of ceramic material will melt at certain temperatures. So there's kind of this uh, constant natural cyclical conversation happening. So yeah, I think that's my five minutes. So I'll sign off for the next person. Let me. Yeah, that's me. Uh, my name is Mark Hendry. Uh, I currently live in Blue Ridge, Georgia in the Southern Appalachians and I was born in the Northern Appalachians. And I've always been an uh, outdoors person. Um, when I was very young, uh, probably about five, I would take sticks and shells and acorns and I would make things and I would go door to door and sell them. I was an entrepreneur also. I think people bought them just to probably either get rid of me or because I was cute. but. I've always liked to make things from found materials. And I'm a first generation American. My parents are both British. And gardening is a big part of British culture. So we have always gardened. I've worked as a uh, in landscaping and gardening since I was 10. My first job was digging holes uh, when I was 10 years old. When I was 12, it was installing bricks in uh, English herb gardens. And then I worked at an herbery. And so I've always kind of worked with natural materials and worked with plants. Um, the most organic material I've worked with is um, human beings. I was a choreographer and dancer for 20 years with two huge 10,000 square foot schools and over 1,200 students a year. And um, I've had both of my hips replaced uh, 10 times. So I don't do that anymore. So I got to go back to more of my natural love, which is uh, working with natural materials. Um, I do broom making and basket making primarily, and I like to grow my own materials. So I grow my own broom corn and I harvest my own handles. I work with the forest service and ecologically work to take, um, they need underbrushing done. So they'll give me a section of forest each year to go underbrush and take anything one inch or smaller in diameter. And the brooms that I do, I started, I like to learn craft and then push it into art. This is a Celtic wedding broom. Uh, it's a combination of dark and light, black and white, and two becoming one. And there's a lot of representation in the brooms that I do, but it's how can you take something that is functional and make it into a beautiful piece of art. And I also like the fact that each piece is unique. And I love the element of surprise that you get from working with natural materials because I never know how things are gonna come out. I feel like I collaborate with nature, that nature is an artisan. Like if you look at that piece there in the picture, nature's work is there. I didn't take it away, I worked with it. So we collaborate together. I'm not one of those artists that tries to erase or turn the natural piece of material into what I want it to be, I try and let it speak to me 
and let it have a say in the creation of the artwork that I do. And that's why I have a willow farm so I can grow my own material. I don't have to grow my own broom corn. There are places that sell broom corn and as a teacher, I need to buy broom corn because it's a lengthy process. But every year I grow broom corn because there's something about um, art from the ground up where um, like for those who use clay, the self-reliant potter where you go and dig the clay, I really like the from the earth up approach so that the material that I work with, I really have an intimate relationship with. And another thing for me, not to get too um, corny, but for me, that is my spiritual connection, the outdoors. I'm also a photographer, but I've really gotten away from photography since it's become more about computer time. Things that get me outside are the things that I have the longest relationship with because outside is where I feel my deepest spiritual connection. Um, this is an antler basket. The antler is a shed antler that was found. There's the, one of the materials in there is kudzu. Another one is wool that was dyed by a friend with indigo and spinach, I believe. And um, so I'd like to do a lot of barter with people. I like to do a lot of natural dye material. Unfortunately for broom corn, the only success I've had is with walnut because broom corn is very resistant to dye. So it's very, very challenging to dye. But for basketry materials, like kudzu is a really great material to dye. But I work with barks and grasses and anything natural, I will try and weave and work with. And taking that craft, something like that's a traditional Appalachian antler shaped basket, but then really pushing the boundaries of what a traditional basket is what it looks like and what its purpose is and sometimes for me it's way more about capturing space or creating shape than having something that is functional but I think when you can do both it's really the for me that's the best of both worlds when you have something that is beautiful and functional awesome thanks Mark Anna hi um my name is Anna Johnson, and I am a studio artist working out of uh, Asheville, North Carolina. And I was actually going to be teaching two classes at Aramont in uh, 2020. And the first one was part of the legacy program, which if um, viewers don't know anything, and especially if you are a K through 12 teacher in the Appalachian region, you should check it out because it is truly amazing. And I had the honor to teach it in 2019 as well. And it was a, I mean, it was just such a fulfilling experience for me just to get a chance to interact with teachers um, in the region and, and get that insight that I don't normally have access to as a um, studio artist. But that course was called, um, or it's called Roots of Heirlooms. And, it's a really fun class. It's kind of, it's a beginner's metals class overall. And then the focus is kind of learning and, and, and getting that core um, base in the skills, but then also talking about what jewelry symbolizes and how it's played a role in, in our culture and more personal, you know, because one of the beauties of jewelry, I think, is because it's small and durable it can cross generations and so because of that you know a lot of people have these special pieces that remind them of certain people or times or you know um, just memorable events in general and so for me bringing that idea into a classroom not only just can maybe be a cool a fun conversation but i think as far as a class dynamic goes it also can bring that back to the bench and create conversation too, because talking about it can, is a, for me, it's like a, a nice icebreaker and getting to get some more insight into individuals, um, personalities and experiences. Um, the other class that I was going to be teaching was called Saw Set and Solder. And that is, again, it's just um, covering the basics and which I just love to do and really, uh, influence or really encouraging people to to be playful and to 
make multiple pieces and just like get your hands in different stuff and really break out of the you know the a box as far as like what materials you can use and so a lot of kind of like creative problem solving when it comes to setting different materials and stuff like that and uh and the pieces that i make personally i really like to bring that playful energy into my studio and and if there's something that seems challenging say for example i use a lot of natural material basically all the natural material in my pieces and a lot of that has been a lot of uh, experimentation for me uh, because it's important uh, for jewelry to not only be something that is going to be beautiful and you know it's be a, a form of self-expression that you can actually like wear out into the world but it's also very important for whatever i'm putting into my pieces to be durable and so when you're working with you know really delicate plants or bone or stone part of the process for me is figuring out how to get it to be in the pieces and not have it feel like it's going to get smashed or you know whatnot and of course there are certain more you know pieces that you might wear to a special event you know and you're not going to like you had a family reunion and wanting to give everybody bear hugs. But, um, you know, so that bringing the challenge of how to incorporate really delicate materials into the pieces is, is something that um, I definitely bring into my studio. So I like to encourage students, not even if it's like a delicacy, but just of encouraging people to, if you want to do that, like, let's find a way, because there's probably a way that we can accomplish this. Um, so going back to my process and the thought behind the pieces is, well, first it, it started with my just general awe of the so many beautiful individual elements that make up the natural world and the endlessness of and the intricacies of all of these different organisms and for me it, can, it can't it has not been able to like lose the magic because it's just just like crafts just like art just like life in general you know we never stop learning and discovering so for me it's kind of a practice in opening up my myself for discovery and then bringing that in and putting it in a different context and bringing it to the pieces so then I can share it with others. And, you know, with the pieces of themselves and with the bone and stuff like that is conceptually, I want to remove the taboo that we've placed on it as a society and then, you know, change the language a little bit. So with the plants and the bone and stuff like that, give like kind of like uh lift them up in another sense that maybe they're not represented in a lot of ways and um and kind of make that accessible so thanks anna <laughs> kenya hi um my name is kenya miles i'm in baltimore maryland um I am a textile artist and a natural dyer, and um, yeah, there's a lot of uh, twists and turns on the journey um, to becoming an artist, which um, kind of like Mark said, I was an artist selling um, pictures very young, uh, entrepreneurially, um, to my dad's coworkers, and then to um, people in school who needed bubble letters. Um, so I think one of the things that um, I was always certain of was that I wanted to be an artist. And so the journey has sort of um, looked very different than I had expected. Um, I went to school in New York um, and majored in computer art and worked in television and film for many years and sort of decided that at some point I really wanted to be more connected to um, craft and tradition. And so I decided to move to Mexico 
um, Oaxaca, Mexico, um, and I lived there for um, a year and I was able to work with um, several artists. Um, the major work that I did was um, in weaving. And so I learned how to weave. I learned um, a lot of aspects of what, um, what that looks like in a traditional setting. And that kind of was the um, blueprint for me going forward. So I've spent the last um, probably 15 years traveling um, into different countries and spending time with different artisans, learning different practices. So Ghana, Panama. Um, and so the first picture was actually my son and I um, who have been working, um, well, he's not, you know, it's, it's not legal, um, but he comes sometimes. Um, and we, uh, when I landed in Baltimore, there um, was a project that was started by the state um, doing um, natural dyes. And so um, I was sort of uh, brought in as an, as an artist in residence through the Maryland Institute College of Art and um, Parks and People Foundation. And so we've been growing Baltimore, we've been growing indigo and natural dyes in Baltimore for the last 18 months. And the project actually ends the farm side on Friday. So um, I've just been sort of in the thick of seed, um, seed collecting and harvesting. Um, and in January of 2020, um, as a part of um, an extension of this project, knowing that it had sort of an end, uh, I started a studio called Blue Light Junction, which is a natural dye studio in um, Baltimore City and Greenmount West. And the intention of the studio is essentially to bring all of these voices that we have um, sort of been represented in um, the project and to elevate them and to make accessible what I'm often likening to the life of a poet. Um, being a natural dyer is something that's really um, esoteric and like, how can you do that? And we have all these students who um, came through the program or students that we touched in um, camps over the summer of 2019, um, which was really amazing and how um, we can allow those spaces to be accessible. Um, so Rosa Chang, who um, is, is a partner of mine, we're here working on um, creating um, a reduction for indigo and we're doing an extraction process. Um, and so that, that has been a really intense um, experience and one that has been really grounded in um, community and uh, physicality. And I threw my back out a couple times this year. Um, I did probably seven to eight harvest. Um, we also have other farms. Uh, Baltimore has a really wonderful, wonderful urban agricultural um, community. And so we have other farms that have piloted uh, with us uh, through Blue Light Junction to do other, um, to grow additionally um, indigo so that we can work on having um, a collective more circular economy so we can offer people within Baltimore City and through um, through the region the opportunity to use natural dyes through um, um, any means. And so the actual practice, um, the teaching that I was intending to do in 2020, which I will do in 2021, is really about mark making and making paint um, using um, uh, earth pigments and ochres and plants. And so that's something that um, is really pow powerful for me. And this image on the left was um, UC Botanical Garden, um, a dear friend, Sasha Durer, um, had a 10 year anniversary of sort of celebrating um, botanical color. And so we did um, a collective of artists and I, designers, put together a botanical fashion show in the Redwoods in um, Berkeley last year. And so this is um, a cochineal top that comes from the prickly pear nopal um, bug and also uh, the bottom is hand painted with mordens and it's a linen with iron and um, matter root. So these are all things that I've grown either in my space when I lived in California or we are currently growing in our garden um, in Baltimore. And this is um, a personal piece. Um, I'm really into this sort of um, practice of iron and tannin, which is originally um, some of the things that I've taught. I've been teaching natural dyes for about seven or eight years. And um, what's been interesting is sort of finding these pieces. I actually started these when my son was a year old um, as like a way to continue to work and also create a space where he could see his mother working, not as like an artist in theory, but in action. And so that was really important for me. Um, and so I basically made um, a textile painting a day 
um, which was exhaustive because I was working um, a full-time job and parenting. So I'm pretty sure I was like up for 17 or 18 hours every day um, for the first two years of his life. So, um, but now I've looked back on these pieces and have started adding stitching. Um, I'm fortunate enough to be a part of um, a quilting group through members of MICA and the African American Quilters of Baltimore and a number of other people who are participating. And so it's just got me activated in um, looking at these older pieces and, um, you know, enhancing them with, with, um, with thread. Awesome. Full disclosure, Kenya, I was signed up to take your class this summer. Oh, nice. It was going to be my first ever craft workshop and I was absolutely devastated. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, hopefully, yeah, we're, we're going to do it again next year. And we've talked about trying to activate some of the space in the, um, on the residency or in this, in, um, on Aeromont to be able to use some of um, the plants that we can grow with, um, with the workshop or with the class. So that would be really amazing. Wow. Yeah. Well, I know that y'all touched a little bit on this in your introductions, but the first question that I have for y'all, um, I guess more specifically, is how does being outside in your studio, like how does that manifest specifically in your studio practices? And anybody can jump in at any time. I think it, it's setting the schedule is a huge part of it for me. You know, there's weather conditions, there are physical you know, like there's things that you have to um, almost put in the schedule that it's going to knock your schedule off. It's for me, it's been really, um, there's been a lot of kind of having to balance. If you're in an academic setting and you work outside, you have to bend over backwards sometimes to make things fit within that academic schedule that are unnatural. So that's kind of my first thought with that question. For me, uh, starting now is my harvest time. So I'm not in the studio as much now. I will be outside, handles, weaving material, everything is at this time of year. Everything that I harvest now for broom handles needs a year to dry. So I'm harvesting now for next year's materials. And the same thing for a lot of the basketry materials, it needs time to dry. So this is my favorite time of year because I will spend most of the next five months outside. So I have an excuse to take a hike. <laughs> um, I took a trip to Rhode Island to harvest driftwood and got to right off the trip. It was wonderful and had a van full of driftwood. Uh, so this, that, th this is my favorite time of year. Then I go into production mode and kind of squeeze the art in between as I get orders. And at Christmas time is tough for that. Christmas becomes really busy for people that want gifts. But this is my outdoor time, definitely my favorite time. Um, I, I'm not, I don't have to be quite as, as uh, regimented as far as um, looking at, at, you know, harvesting in, in, in that sense, because I, when I'm collecting stuff, some of stuff is, is seasonal as far as like what is growing in spring versus fall. So I can go out and just really find things to incorporate in at all points. And I like to let that guide me in some sense. Um, also with the plants specifically is the casting process that I do, which is a traditional process, lost wax casting, where usually you think of it as, if you know anything about it, if you, if you think about that, but most people don't, but it would be carving something out of wax and then taking a mold of it, melting the wax out, pouring your metal and getting it into your mold, however you choose to do that. And then for me, I am, instead of carving wax, I actually collect the plants because for me, I, there, I cannot do anything better than how Mother Nature is doing it. So why not try to just encapsulate uh, that? So the process though is not as successful uh, because I am relying on a lot of the natural forms to create space for the metal to flow through. So because of that, uh, I'll usually collect a fair amount and then cast and um, 
cast a lot of things so I can continue to pull and work from. And um, so I have like drawers of just like cast plants um, and, and I kind of work in a collage like format. And then as far as the bones that I use that, I do think about, um, you know, I, I, decomposition and, and what that process can mean. So say, you know, if I have some, you know, some critters that have passed and everything is, is natural and, and, you know, are, are found. And so some of that requires burying. So I usually would do that. I could do that at all points in a year, but then, so say in summer, you know, when things are all hot, they're going to decompose quicker. So, you know, I, I'll consider that when, um, you know, when I'm working on certain parts, but a lot of it, I just kind of like when I don't have anything else to, if I'm like kind of stuck in a studio um, and things aren't flowing or I have like a little downtime, that's really when I can venture out and just tap into another part of it, which is just like, it's great. So yeah, I think for my practice, um, I've been farming for the last two years um, professionally. And so um, one of the things that's been interesting is having, um, you know, doing a natural dye farms and gardens and really understanding like um, the sort of life expectancy of things. Like there are things that will come up and um, go down and, you know, we've had all of these like bursts of things. Um, and I think a lot of that really just informs like our collection or the time that we're um, gonna, you know, experiment with certain things. It really is for me, um, the height of like, um, I start growing indoors um, February um, all the way until um, things get set in the ground. So from February until I would say right about um, uh, early November, um, I'm in full like outdoor time. And so for me, I'm the opposite um, where Mark is ready to be out in, you know, in the world. I'm like, that is enough. Thank you so much, nature. Uh, it is time to be in the bear cave. Um, so for me right now, it's like this wind down time and it, and it is this constant, um, um, you know, sort of conflict because this is the time when everything else is trying to speed up because of holiday because of you know it's the end of the year physical whatever people need to do that is like you know capitalist it like rushes and and i feel really um have always felt really disconnected from it but the last two years have been very clear to me why i feel disconnected because of the natural routine of the plants and the habit that i make um, in my practice so I'm really trying to find ways to like now be internal. I also paint. So, um, and I, you, you know, use soy milk and I use other um, earth pigments to paint with. Um, and so I'm now I'm really excited about the time to be inside and like painting and just, you know, watching the world sort of go by without me in it, you know, like, oh, there go some things. <laughs> like, uh, um, so yeah, I would say that's, that's what affects my practice for sure. Magic. Um, so the second I question, the second question I have for y'all, um, cultures have been creating under the sun and stars for generations. How can we better understand issues around appropriation in craft and practice skill sharing in a thoughtful and intentional way? What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I think for me, this is, this is something that I sort of put forth. And one of the things that, um, has been really profound for me is being in a space where I'm connected to all of these cultures and I'm learning through all of these cultures, but also to really understand and honor that like these things are not mine to, um, you know, take forth in either a teaching space or a space that looks like, um, you know, my work uh, somehow, you know, or their work somehow through my work. And so I'm really mindful about what that looks like. But as I'm more integrating, um, indigenous practice into care of and stewardship of the land this is something really important to me too because i want to honor that like there's all of this ancient technology that i'm hoping to bring forth but that is not mine alone right so that's the thing that i think has just been really um important for me and one of the things that i have been really coming to understand is that um asking you know for permission of a plant, asking for permission of um, 
a process asking, you know, and also naming your, um, you know, your teacher, your guide, um, really honoring that lineage, um, bringing those things forth and, and allowing for people to, um, to know that um, this is a this is a system. If we were in um, you know a certain context, this would be a family lineage. You know, this would be a a, a town or or community's lineage. And so, really, just being able to because for me, contextually, when I've been in spaces and I know where the work um, sort of originated. You know, however, right there are really at this point no true origins that are clear, but it's like it it makes it more um, expansive for me. And I can take that forth and share that knowledge in a way that's not like, oh, this is just a technique. It's cool. Um, there are other things that are behind it, other people, other ways, other systems. And we built last year, um, uh, what's called a waffle garden, I think just colloquially, but it's, um, a Zuni Pueblo practice, which is basically building these sort of like concave in, um, sunken in areas because they're in really arid, dry, um, regions. And so, we use that um, as a practice and I had never built that and people were like, what's a waffle garden? I was like, I don't know. Um, so I was really excited to try it, but also really wanted to honor this, this space of like, I'm, I'm in a learning space. I'm not here to like, you know, tell people to, you know, uh, this is the way to go. So I, I think that one of the things that was, I learned in that practice was just honoring the work and consistently speaking the name of the community that I, you know, had researched, um, and 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 what the principles around um, the practice were. Um. That's that's interesting. And I actually just realized that um, almost everyone here is based in the Appalachian region. And so I wonder if y'all have thoughts on on those those two things like intersecting at all. Well, can I? Um, I I want to kind of just go back to kind of what like Kenya was saying. I think you just articulated so much of that so um, clearly. And uh, so just to like, I guess, say it in different words, but um, the, you know, I think one thing, you know, I can't exactly what you were saying is just um, by incorporating different elements into the work and really just being like, open and learning and then humble I, I, humble is a funny word so i don't know i mean so excuse it if it's like that's not right but like um just being a, acknowledging where you're you are getting what you're bringing in because there are so many different things and so much has been done and um you know, and then also articulating that to the people that you come in contact with and, and, and knowing, you know, examining where that's, where your different techniques are, are coming from. Um, it's, I think it's just, it's so important and it's kind of funny with, uh, I think a lot of things and based in like this capitalist, society in the sense of like we're all this um sorry i'm not articulating this very well but this idea of kind of like you we work hard on our own and then we climb this ladder and then all these things and it's it almost takes away from that you know the idea of working in a community and having help and assistance and inspiration from so many different spaces so like by being able to share that, but then also, you know, with respect to where you're getting it from. Um, and, you know, I think there are so many examples, you know, not necessarily in art and craft, but it just in like um, marketing and stuff in general of things that have been done for a long time. And then a new group comes in and it's just like, look at this thing that we did and, and created and then like apply it to maybe a different um uh market uh, like a group of people and then like remarket as our own and like take and like change the price points and do all these things where it it's it's um like it's disturbing in a way that 
uh, where you're where people is kind of like monetizing off of um, cultural appropriation. So I think just like the opposite of that is just like knowing what you're doing and if you're like sharing things rather than trying to claim them. Yeah, and um, I'm not really in the Appalachian area. A lot of the techniques that we use in wood firing um, are coming from Japan, Korea, China, um, that region of the world. And for me, I just, I feel like dialogue is the key to so much of this. Just being able to talk um, to, especially if you're in an academic setting, making a safe space for people to talk about these issues, explaining a direct path of how that information came to be taught is really important. And just being, I think now we're in a time of like hyper awareness of um, so many kind of missteps that we've been constantly taking. So like let those uncomfortable conversations happen, especially around your students. Let people express it, work it out. And, you know, I think that now is not the time to kind of like shut it down. It's time to look inward. You know, I have, like Kenya was saying, I have so far to go with this, so much to learn. So kind of looking inward about, you know, how your own biases are creeping in and also just like allowing space for people to discuss, I think is so important. <laughs> Yeah, and I actually have um, an audience question that pertains to this um, really well. So when harvesting or collecting materials in your practice, how does sustainability factor into the considerations of what you take? Yeah, I mean, we, I definitely, we sort of joke as we're, you know, harvesting things like leave some for the bees, you know, um, because also um, I think we've had a lot of interesting things happen at the garden where like people have thought things were weeds and I don't call them weeds. I either call them robust plants or plants we're not cultivating. Um, and one of the things that I've talked about with a fellow natural dyer is the, the, the reality that, you know, my lack of understanding of the nature of something ultimately will lead to its destruction. Right. And so we can put that forth and think about just like the colonialist men mentality. Right. Um, and so how things can be easily dismissed. And so one of the things that I really do is like, I'm looking at something and I'm like connecting to it, you know? So as I'm gathering or as I'm, um, we did, you know, a couple of weeks ago, like a, a, a nine, you know, I-95 like um, harvest. Cause I was like, there's all these plants. We have to go on the highway and jump out and, you know, I have friends who were okay with that. So we, we were collecting and, you know, we didn't take all of the, you know, uh, sumac and we didn't collect all of the grasses. We just were sort of like, you know, there and, and really looking at like, what is here? What do we need? You know, and taking, taking what we need and asking for that and, and, and also understanding that things have to perpetuate their own lives. So if we're just cutting something down, like, you know, plants want to grow. I mean, that's why in urban environments, you see plants growing through concrete. They want to grow. They are here. And so if, if I leave something, um, and even, you know, trying now low, low to no till, if I leave something, it's going to come back, you know, it, it's here to stay. And so that's a part of my practice is really just like connecting to something, taking, taking what I need, asking permission. And I heard um, in one of the, um, sort of uh, documents that I was reading about indigenous sort of um, engagement in, in nature is like, you know, really setting an intention, you know, letting, letting the plant know or letting the um, material know what your intention is. Um, I think is really just about, we're all talking about, you know, these cosmic spaces, but it's like, it's, it's very true, you know, like they are, they are somewhere hearing something. And so we have to speak it into existence to honor that, you know, and, and hold ourselves accountable for it, you know. Mark, do you have thoughts on this? Yeah, one of the things I love about having uh, willow as one of my materials, it's English basketry willow. And if you don't cut it back every year, my, my window is really short. If you're up north, you probably have about a five month harvesting window. I have December and January, and you have to harvest when all the leaves are down because the minute it starts to set pussy willows and the sap is running, then, the, then it would come off unless you're going to peel it. But that willow, there are stools in England and the willow farms where they still grow it that are 100 years old. 
stool is the, the part that you cut the willow from. It wants to be cut back to thrive. Mm -hmm. The minute you let it go and become a tree, it only has about a 10, 15 year lifespan and it dies off. So it's one of those materials that renews and renews and renews the more you use it. So it's a really ecological um, material. The other thing is like for broom handles, I work with Forest Service and I go in and I underbrush, which makes a much healthier forest. So everything that I take, that's an inch, that's why I say it's always an inch, my contract is for an inch or smaller, it helps the forest thrive. So I think there's a way to get your materials. And I also use kudzu, a lot of kudzu. And if, for those of you in the South that know what kudzu is, actually when I went to Aramont and I um, helped a teacher, we went and got a bunch of kudzu off the hillsides. Nobody, There's plenty. It's, it's, it's like scourge. Everyone's like, take more, take more. But those kind of things, using them in art, um, to me adds value. Because without it, it feels like you are, um, it's a harsh word, but you're kind of raping nature. You're, you're taking something rather than, um, I think it's one of the things, the asking permission, the concept of asking permission. And, and, the, and the, for me, the time I spend in the willow field, I am communing with the willow. And the willow does know what my intention is. And it's uh, what I do for the willow when I take the willow strengthens the willow. It doesn't hurt it, it helps it. So it makes me feel it's a win-win. And that's in, in a lot of the art that I do, I try and make it a win-win. And the other thing about cultural appropriation is I think um, as an artist and a teacher, I think of myself as a vessel. So everything that I bring forth, and I have a good memory, I've had many teachers along the way, and I remember where I learned everything. So I have no problem telling people who and what and where I learned these different things from, because I think that's part of what I bring to the table as a teacher. But the other thing is, one of the things that I teach is, um, used to be called Cherokee bark basketry, which was, I learned it, like it's one of those, I'm very into Appalachian history and Appalachian, do a lot of research. And um, it came from the Cherokee and I learned from one of the couples that learned from the last Cherokee that used to teach the technique. So when I had advertised that I was doing Cherokee bark basketry, they reached out and were like, mm -mm -mm, you can't say that. But I wanted to give credit because that's who it's that's who the technique came from. So I wanted to honor that culture. But they said, no, please just call it traditional bark basketry. And at this point, I've kind of turned it more into art and made it my own thing. But at that time, it's that really fine line of am I honoring them by using the name or am I disrespecting them by using the name? And I have to be really open as an artist to being taught by each culture what is and isn't appropriate for them and respecting their feelings. It isn't about how I feel about it. It's about how that culture feels about it. And I think that's a really fine line to walk as an artist and a teacher. Yeah, I wanted to just piggyback on the end of what you said, Mark, just about like <clears throat> you off, you basically being a vessel for the work, but also supporting the um, perpetuation of the, the plants that you're working with. Like, Part of it is also, I think people have this feeling because um, humans have done so much to destroy the earth that we, in the last, you know, 400 years or so, that we are ultimately, um, you know, uh, bound to some demonic space and that we need to get out. The truth is that we just need to learn what we were supposed to do uh, originally, right? And so that's sort of like re reconnection to how we are meant to steward and connect to the plants. Like, taking ourselves out of the equation makes it seem like we were we were here um, unintentionally we're here for a purpose um, we, we might not all be in some higher you know elevated space of purpose living every day or you know i'm not i'm not here to tell people to do that but what i am saying is like it's a symbiotic relationship you know and we are all here to do something collectively and if we honor that and we find that we have power not to dominate things, but to support and sustain things, then I think things will be more collected um, and connected and thrive in a different way. And we will thrive, right? Because we're all suffering. And you have to know that that's because we're causing our planet to suffer. We're causing the people that we are here, we're causing the plant, you know, the animals to suffer, right? It's all connected very, very clearly to me. And there's a really great book for those of y'all watching. I highly 
recommend reading Braiding Sweetgrass by okay. Robin Kimmer. <laughs> um, she talks about all of these ideas and um, I, th I think that it'd be really beneficial for anyone interested in this conversation. I have to echo that too. I was like, literally that like book Braiding Sweetgrass was going through my mind because I've been holed up just like reading, reading, reading. Um, Cause we've been, you know, isolated so long. And yeah, like she goes back and forth between science and um, this kind of like innate spirituality. It's beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Look, and I also will third that. I think I'm like, cause everyone read that book. It's so, yeah, it's beautiful. Um, and I, man, yeah, Kenya and Mark, both everything that both of y'all just said, I was like, uh, Kenya, God, I wish I had written. I just went and got my paper because but it's recorded. It's recorded. <laughs> yeah. So whatever I said, because I won't remember what I said. Trust me. I'll oh right. my God. Like, oh, I have to write that down. There was just like, no, um, you know, it was like back at that, right when you first started talking about, about, um, you know, the sustainability and, and then talking about the um, weeds and to not understand something. Oh so, yeah, the nature of something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It was so lovely, so I'm not gonna try to, I'm just gonna butcher it if I try to um, paraphrase, but uh, I think that for, for me, you know, and I'm not doing the, um, you know, the farming and, and everything as as um, like you are, and um, so for me going out and something that I really try to encourage to, to other people that are interested in working outdoors is to just like move through it with respect and connection and having the intention, you know, same thing that y'all were saying, and to you're not and and the idea of going out and being thankful and gracious for what you're finding and and with the intention for me you know to bring it in and honor it and to perpetuate that the beauty that you know this language that i can understand through um form you know form of the of the plants and so whatever i can get out of that to encapsulate that to then, you know, ultimately spread and, 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 you know, being not getting greedy in nature and not going in it with the idea of taking and, um, but the idea of like learning and connecting. And I think that also comes back into my studio practice. And for me personally, I always, whenever I'm doing shows or something like that and have ongoing conversations, you know, flash conversations with people that might be stepping in and might see my work, say, looking at the bone and, and, you know, a lot of people will have, uh, you know, different ideas as far as like, you know, their own experiences and what the bones can, can represent and then the potential of like, did I, like, how did I come to these and stuff like that. So being a lover of the environment and always wanting to, you know, not, maybe not always doing the best, but wanting to be, a, wanting to coexist and, and not you know, take and hurt is just um, kind of communicating that, exactly again what what y'all were saying about that we are here for a reason like we're not aliens on this planet and that we can we don't have to exist in our own separate world from the rest of nature and so i think like becoming part of that picture with like respect and everything is um you know on the forefront i think in in my process so I have one last question for y'all. We have about three minutes left. This hour has flown. Um, as educators, how has teaching at craft schools or in academia affected your own studio practice? Um, I, um, I'm a pretty recent grad from IU. I graduated in 2019. Um, and they, I would say working outside 
there is a lot of tension between that academic schedule, you know, needing to be respectful of other people working within the academic sphere, and also really genuine, kind of genuinely portraying what your um, your topic is about. You know, actually setting the pace. You know, I try to go back and forth and make sure that um, I can um, give students that you know, like it's not the concept of wood firing, it's actual wood firing with actual material, the things that come from the earth. And um, this is what the hard labor it takes to go get those trees and identify them. And so that balance between needing to make sure that, you know, we fit within that, you know, we're an integral part of that academic genre, um, but also, um, giving some space for um, giving some space for kind of how that process or how that craft is done when you're not under the pressure of academic scheduling. Yeah, you know, one of the things that I have found challenging as a teacher is I'm teaching both craft and art. And sometimes before you have to learn to walk before you can run. So for me, it's like, I have one class called Brooms from the Ground Up. They learn everything they need, everything about the craft from growing it, harvesting it. They literally, the first thing they do is they come and they harvest the broom corn. They take the sticks, it's the whole thing. The next class I have is a week long class called The Artful Broom. And that's all about exploring broom making as an artist. They're two different things. And it's allowing each individual to shine where their interest lies. But I think it's for me, teaching a craft, it's, it, it's, it's a hard balance not to lose the art aspect of it or the, um, the unique original artistry of each individual and what they bring to the process. Does anyone else find that to be true? Yeah, I think I I sort of feel like even the work that I do personally sort of is taking a uh, craft, taking tradition and, you know, living in different places, learning something that's very specific and then evolving my experiences of those traditions into something that's more contemporized, right? And I think that that happens in time. It doesn't just, and so one of the things that I had to really, I spent a lot of time grappling with when I lived in California was like, you know, I used to say I was an artist who didn't make anything because my work took forever. And I think once I accepted that in my own work and it made it easier for me to teach because people were always trying to get to the finish line. Like I would even have people come to a diet class and say, okay, so I wanna add this and I wanna add this and then I wanna do this and then I wanna do this. So what's gonna happen? And I would say, I don't know, I don't know. You know, and sometimes I would just look at the pot and I'm like, throw it in, we'll see. You, it's not for me to like give you some resolution to your work. You want to you wanna be like this person or, you know, this might, this may or may not be the work for you. I mean, I've definitely had people come into my class. I've explained things. I do my best not to make it long, you know. We just get to the work, you know. And people say, thank you, you know, this isn't for me. And I'm like, okay, just stay another 30 minutes. And that same person every time is the person who comes back they make the most interesting thing. And they also are so grateful that they, that they tried it because it's this elongated thing that you can't put your mind around. It's just the physicality. And so for me, I'm actually teaching a class at MICA this semester that runs alongside uh, building Blue Light Junction, right? So we have this demonstration garden, we have the studio, we have Harvest, but we're all online this year. And so what does that look like? Um, and so we've just been doing a lot of like retention of um, theory. And a lot of that is really foundational and it's important and it seems not necessary because you just wanna be making stuff and you just wanna be like dying everything blue, which is like everybody's thing. But actually this is foundational, you know, this is really, really important. And so when you get to the step where you're dying stuff, your work will look different because of those foundations. And so that for me has been um, really just the, the, the journey, I think. Um, I, with teaching, um, I, every, I feel like it's, it's such a honor or like a, a, 
privilege to get to come into people coming to, yeah, this medium that uh, is not for everyone and, and getting to just see the inner workings and how um, each person will start to work through it and seeing a lot of bits of my own personal like journey through my medium um, show up in different ways with different people and so with jewelry it's all very small and very precise and um and intricate and so I get a lot out of that in my own practice and also because of how I work I work with like a whole bunch of different little pieces which like requires organization to some extent and then um it's that like level of precision and stuff like that where I don't really get to I don't live that like outside of the studio and then but to encourage see that kind of struggle for people not to like wanting to cut corners and stuff like that and having to really bring people back to um you know the basis of the process and if you skip these steps if you don't look at the full picture then you're you're not if your product is probably not going to be successful because that's what it takes and so it's just always like this kind of like constant beautiful reminder and then of course seeing fresh minds you know you you they people come to all sorts of different discoveries and just at every time i feel like in these academic settings like you know especially in craft schools and stuff like that where these group efforts of people the possibilities just seem to expand so much more and um you know i've had the good fortune to um assist one of my mentors bob ebendorf at aramont who is just has inspired so many people throughout the art jewelry field and if anyone has had the um lucky the you know the honor to have met this man he the energy that he brings to the table is just like this playful happy giving um energy and and so i think coming into the classroom and it it's this reminder of how energy can spread throughout a space and so you know, keeping that positive energy and seeing how that trickles out, like to your peers and and students and all of that, it's just um, it's just like a really a good reminder to to come home and like take that into you know your community outside of the craft community as well. Um, I lied earlier. We're actually going until one fifteen, but um, I do have one extra question um, for all the folks at home and for me. Um, what advice do you have for folks that want to take their studio practice outside? Mm, I would say the first and foremost thing is I, I think that it is a, a great thing to do. And then just to, going back to what we were talking about earlier, is just to make sure that if if that's something that a uh, individual wants to pursue is to remember that you by going out there and doing that to remember that you're part of a whole and you know and you know to go at it with respect and and intention when you're when you're doing when you're doing that but also it's a beautiful way to connect and get to know and feel more intimate with the environment. So I think it's essential in some ways. Other thoughts, Mark? I didn't mean to cut you off there earlier. Um, one word, when just listening to what Anna said, is stewardship. I feel that we have a responsibility um, to take care of those things in nature. So I think a lot of, if you can make the word respect has been used. If, if you can make that part of your interaction, I think, again, it's that win-win that idea. You can get what you need and benefit nature in the process. 
And the other thing I was going to say was, I learn as much from my students as they learn from me. And that's not a cliche. I've learned, and often the things I teach, I'll say, oh, I learned this because a student said, what would happen if we did this? And I always, I never say no. That's one of my rules. I go, let's see. I don't know. Let's see. And I've learned amazing, wonderful cheats and fixes and discoveries from my students. And that's one of the joys of teaching is it really, I expand as an artist in what I learned from them. Um, one thing that, one piece of advice that I would give to people who want to start working arts outside or bring more nature into their studio practice is start observing, start really directing and focusing your attention on, you know, these natural elements around you. Um, quiet that part of, you know, the, the doubt and the things that are kind of, you know, telling you that thing, you know, things that you've heard are a certain way or things like pre disposed ways that we have of kind of um, thinking and passing around information and really just observe. So get your mindset into um, paying attention to what's going on in that moment and what you're, you know, what is happening with that material in a focused direct way without kind of the rest of the, I have to be somewhere at 10 o'clock, you know, all of these other things that are kind of swirling around in our minds all the time. Uh, yeah, I would sort of say um, a song lyric comes to mind, uh, which is we get there when we do. And I think we're all programmed within the context of this society is to be in mastery of something. Um, but the truth is levels of mastery really don't exist. I mean, the truth is that true masters of, of you know, work um, and again, a work that has been done, you know, I've met people who've been doing things for like 50 years and they're like, oh, I'm still learning, you know, I'm apprenticing. And, and I think really to honor that, like, as you are processing through your practice, that um, your, your time is evolving as it's meant to. It's not about, um, you know, it's not a race. It's not, you don't have to be the person who is like the best at it. You don't have to be the one who's the most knowledgeable. I think that those things prevent us from um, being connected to the work. So stay grounded in yourself, stay grounded in your journey, stay grounded in the things that are near you. And one of the reasons why I started teaching is because I didn't have any friends who knew what I was talking about. So I was like, you know, here I am dying plants and people are like, uh, you know, what is that? And so I started teaching because I said, well, I need some people that I can sit around and talk to about this stuff. Um, and the truth is that their explorations, as Marcus said, like gave me so much more in my own practice because I was, I was at home alone trying it all, you know, or in my studio trying it all alone um, and sort of processing to the best of my knowledge. Um, and now we have a lot more um, spaces where you can find those things. Um, but truthfully, I just think that it's about, um, you know, I've learned things that, you know, from artists and artisans that I, you know, took me 10 years to apply to my practice, right? It wasn't the time. And so not feeling bound to like, oh, I learned this thing now, you know, I remember when I came back from living in Mexico, you know, oh, now you know how to weave rugs. What are you going to do with it? Nothing, nothing. Like, First of all, I'm not going to weave rugs. Like, are you crazy? Like, that, would, <laughs> that just would be costly. Be like, you know, and I, but I, but I, I also honored that it was a practice that I didn't want to monetize because I loved it. And not everything that you do has to be your next career, right? Like something that you do and it makes you money. So also just take into consideration, like some things are just for you. Some things are personal and just about your practice and your work. So take the time you need and um, enjoy it you know, along the way, for sure. That's that, wonderful. That, what you just said about not having, you didn't have the people to talk to about it. So you created that, like, I just can't imagine. I mean, that is just uh, the mindset and just being able to make that decision to be like, well, like well, deciding to build a community of, and around something that is so, niche and and to me I mean I think that natural I mean I took a natural dye course in college and you know I didn't take it much further and but it was just um it you know it was fascinating beautiful and just looking at your images I'm just like have a thousand questions um for you but 
that is just incredible to me because I don't even think that that, like that wouldn't occur to me to just literally just build a community of people to, to bring into something when it doesn't exist. I just, I feel like that is just so inspiring and especially right now when things are so wild and crazy that, um, and people are feeling so isolated that they're like, that's limitless. Like what, just that statement, I feel like you just like blew the roof off of like all of these limitations that we might like create in our own society, especially right now when people are feeling so, you know, however they're feeling. Anyways, I just had to, that just like, that's just awesome. Well, come to Baltimore. We're dying all the time <laughs> in community, you know, so many, so many things that we are doing at Blue Light Junction, which I think that's really what in this time, you know, of, of just distance and uncertainty. And um, we all have really come to be like um, shoulders for each other, um, you know, and if that's like just touching plants and, and I always tell people like, you know, I think that the idea is that I started this space. It is not my space, you know. It is it is a space that is for everyone in this community and will eventually turn into an actual cooperative. I have no intention of like running a business so that I can, you know, have a specific outcome. I'm so interested in what other people's input is. So if you just wanna come and sit and like, you know, touch some cotton, then, then that's what you get to do that day, you know? And so that's the really beautiful thing about, um, just giving people space to discover, really. I think that's a beautiful place to end our talk today. Um, we're coming up on time, but thank y'all so much for joining us and, and having such a nice, thoughtful and open conversation about this idea um, and for sharing your work and all the things that y'all are doing out there in the world. Um, you know, later this week, this recording will go live. So those of, those of you that didn't get to see the whole thing, you can pick back up where you left off. Um, but keep an eye out on our social media for information on uh, our upcoming instructor roundtables, including next month's topic on um, art and technology. Um, but until then, thank you all so much for being here with us. We hope that you'll join us again in November. Um, and on behalf of everyone here at Aramont, we miss you. Please be safe and please stay creative. Thanks, y'all. Thank you, Kelsey. Bye. Bye, Bye. everybody.